So, hey, everyone. I'm going to do the official intro in just a little bit, but just so you can see our sunshiny faces. And, uh, well, my sunshiny, cloudy, sunshiny face, um, your dusk face. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I've been slowly but surely filling out the shelf. Um, I guess behind me there. Obviously, prominent there, hijacking Bitcoin. I have to have it there. The Doge, and then uh, the ETH Dam glass that I got, like from this last time here that we're gonna I'm sure talk about. Uh, what else we got? We got the Vegemite from uh, Naomi Brockwell, of course, and then um, the Defam magazine from uh, Sterling, not Sterling, Sterling, and um, then my old didgeridoo there, which I just started messing around with, um, partially to troll Naomi, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a little sound. <laughs> Those are fun. <laughs> it's good old Jitsi, or you know, Brave Talk is like a Jitsi variant, I guess, or it's a Jitsi instance. So it's, it inherits a lot of that same stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, so how, I mean, how you been? You've been relaxed, been busy, and all the above. Yeah, Joel, man, been pretty damn busy lately, especially I started working with with Logos, right? The same people mm -hmm. involved in Status, right? With uh, Jared Hope, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've just been hardcore pushing this this encryption, this privacy agenda, this decentralized infrastructure thing forward. Aside from that, previously I had worked with Ernesto at Crypto Space for mm -hmm. a couple of years. He's still good friends of mine. And while I was there, we actually had to exit the U.S. Right, we were doing we, were, we had to yeah. exchange, so we we got out of that in the U.S. He still has an, the exchange in Mexico, so mm -hmm. yeah, I've been really really busy on the front lines, really. Yeah, whatever. So is he shut down the exchange in the co-working space? Thing. That's as far as I remember. Um, and he's talking about some cards and stuff these days. I don't know. Are you up on that, or I mean, is it not public? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's public. He has a, a company in Mexico called Prestabit. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Prestabit does there, he's leveraging these crypto cards. I think they have kind of an off relationship with some of the credit card networks. I can't remember which ones. But these cards are pretty special because they have really, really high limits. So people can actually leverage these cards, especially if they're doing a lot of travel. This is right up your alley, actually. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna yeah, never... we'll have to talk <laughs> after this too because um yeah there's a million different different things that are very very important for this but yeah um yeah so what else what else is going on with this guy yes so long story short really in in the u.s we had to stop we, i mean we were doing really good business with the exchange model that we had it was more of an over the counter mm -hmm. model. We were actually developing software as well, as well for uh, kind of a custodianless peer to peer OTC desk that's virtualized. But what, what ended up happening was we just kept getting crushed on the bank account front from the government. Every time we'd get a bank account, we'd spin one up and then we'd get one crushed, right? Because crypto having a crypto bank account is really risky. Just because the fact that it's crypto, they can de-risk you, especially if you're not a well-known player in mm -hmm. the space. I made it really difficult for us. We finally had one that was pretty decent, but then we just kept getting harassed by government agencies all the time. After doing all the KYC, all the AML, playing their little game, right, playing within the context of the system. But it, it ended up being just too much, even though we were doing everything right in accordance with the quote-unquote law and the regulatory environment in the U.S., didn't work out. So we pulled the plug and decided just to stay in Latin America, mainly in Mexico. So I'm still partners in the company in Mexico, but I'm not working on a day to sit anymore with, with Ernesto, but we're still friends. We keep in touch. I'm, I'm loosely involved in the sales team with the cards, but I haven't really booted that up yet. So that's kind of what happened. But Ernesto, other than that, is doing fine. He's still traveling around, pushing the uh, crypto max now, right? Crypto max forward. So it's a good, yeah. good. Hmm. It's fantastic. It's a note on the little regulation thing before we hit the intro and officially get this thing going. Uh, a lot of people don't understand this because people don't work in 
anything, but especially crypto. But the it's there. The rules are not clear. The rules have never been clear, and it's and it's the worst example. Of course, is the U.S. SEC specifically because it's like what is a security, what isn't. They won't tell you explicitly. They just want an enforcement action kind of do stuff, and it's it's really and then they're really hard when the, every enforcement action they've done. They seem to have been really adamant to not designate, try not say that they're trying to designate the token itself as a security. They're trying to say you guys sold it as a security, but please, judge, don't rule on whether or not this token is a security itself. There's a lot of dot that's the dodgiest. But then in in Europe, I've talked to a lot of exchanges and things in Europe, and the laws are semi clear but not completely clear, and it, the regulators won't say, "Hey, you can do that," or "No, you can't do that." You just will do your best and then maybe they'll raid you or something. Maybe they won't. Uh, it's just, and if there's a, a system like that, like say if like Facebook does that with your posts, you can just tell Facebook, just flip them off and, you know, go off to Elon's playground on Twitter or whatever X. Like you can do that, but you can't do that with the government. You can't say, I don't like you regular. Right. I'm going to use this one here. And it's funny because as a last, as an example of this, um, the I'm a big fan. I mean, I'm not a sports guy, but I do train martial arts, so I like watching MMA fights like the UFC. And UFC has been a great ground breeding ground, I guess, for um, crypto and liberty ideas, as it turns out, which is pretty nice to see. But um, they had a drug enforcement agency, a USADA, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, I believe is what it's called. And they used them for many years. And then they finally got rid of them because they didn't like how some of their enforcement actions were going. Some of the unreasonable, vindictive kind of things where they would like wake up an athlete in the middle of the night when they're, they have to fight the next day and disrupt their sleep schedule. And it's just like, come on, they're about to fight. Get them like two days earlier or like after. It's not, they're not going to sneak in a, a drug, you know, in that time. You're not, you will catch it later. And so they fired the regulator. They just said, you're not do get out of here. And then they got a different program to test their athletes for drugs and you know, performance enhancing substances. So what if we could do that in a free market? What if we could just say, you know what? We do kind of want some sort of body that calls out scams and does these kinds of things. And we do want them, but we want them to serve the, the interests of the people. Gary Gensler, you're out. You're not doing your job anymore. Get out of here. Let's hire a different entity entirely. I wish we could do that, but we can't. Thanks, government. <laughs> right. 100%, dude. And what you said is exactly on point, Joel, in terms of there not being a clarity, not being clarity mm -hmm. in terms of the regulations. That is largely by design, right? Because they want to be able to go after whoever they want with impunity. And that's how they have it set up. And that's why the SEC loves this particular situation. And get this. At crypto space, we had a an extremely thorough cryptocurrency due diligence program, right? That's what they call it whenever you analyze and you risk assess each cryptocurrency that you onboard as part of the exchange to sell to customers, even in so far as getting attorney approval letters for said cryptocurrency. So and this was my job, right? I was doing the risk management piece. So I was making sure that every all of our all of our T's were crossed. All of our dies were all, all of our eyes were dotted. Everything was perfect, as far as perfect can be. But that doesn't stop them from looking at you, and that was only one part of it, right? Making sure the mm -hmm. the sec doesn't come after us. The other part was the AML KYC part. Even though we have a full compliance regime, we have everything in place in terms of the the risk management part, right? The channel management, etc. That they'll still banks will question you. The government will question you doesn't matter and this is one thing that we probably get into later as well it, it's a catch-22 situation you can do everything perfect but they can still make your life miserable because the way that the system is designed is to come after cryptocurrency firms and companies and to just shut them down arbitrarily or make their life so hard that it's impossible to do business one of the things that ernesto always says like can we just run as a business <laughs> can we just work freely as a business and unless you have you know multi-millions of dollars to continuously fight back like Coinbase has done right by suing the SEC and you know suing and trying to fight back against subpoenas and, and you just can't you, you it's it's untenable for most companies especially startups. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a nightmare situation there and you know, welcome to the world we're trying to supplant. There's a reason why we're trying to do something different is because this isn't working. 
and um yeah it is what it is but anyway let's hit this intro real quick and then we'll roll right into the the official show part all right go So, hey everyone, happy Friday officially. Welcome to the Digital Cash Rundown, episode 157. So if I do these every week, 157 weeks, it's a lot of weeks. A um, few years by now. Um, I'm joined by the one and only Sterling Lujan. How's it going, man? Man, doing doing fantastic. Really looking forward to the full thrust and brunt of our conversation, brother. It's been a little while. I mean, we, we hung out in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, it's been of just a few days but i miss you already so there you go we had to talk um i Austin. think that i think we first chatted in was it the texas bitcoin conference or something in 2018 it maybe it was either that or it was um politicon or where do you get politicon i don't remember yeah yeah i was at politicon and as it well it was one of those were you at both of those i don't remember if i hung out with that with you just at Politicon or both of them, but it was one of those like 2018, 2019 era either. Yep. That, that's right. And we might've even seen each other. I don't know at one of the pork fests that were earlier, but I can't Li- remember. Libertopia that was in the mix somewhere. I don't know. I'm yep. sure we bumped into each other a lot, but a then lot. there's, there's many years. That was the Bitcoin.com days. And then there's just many years we didn't, didn't really bump into each other physically. And then I saw you're on the speaker list for, ETH Dam this year, and I was like, "Oh, nice! I get to uh, connect with Homeboy again. This is a good time." So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we'll get get, yeah. we'll get to that stuff in a little bit. Let me hit on the main stuff um, first. I got to hit up the never fully prepared for this stuff, but first I have to hit up on the the Coiny TM radar thing because they were kind, kind and generous enough to, to throw me a bag. And um, uh, funny enough, um, Vlad. Kostya, who I just interviewed, the the Bitcoin guy who's kind of upset everyone by interviewing Roger. So um, they almost they wanted to sponsor him, I think, and and then they were like, you know what, I'm going to sponsor this guy instead. So their their sponsorship does end up being on a podcast with him on it anyway. So either way, it all comes full circle. But anyway, talking about Coin ATM Radar. So Coin AT, uh, this podcast is probably sponsored by coin ATM radar. And when you're buying crypto with cash, an ATM is much more reliable and safer than meeting some random person in a random place, especially if it's some like rough neighborhoods, you know, I've seen some weird spots for an ATM, but uh, and unlike an exchange, which could freeze your account, hello FTX, you truly own all the crypto you buy. With coin ATM radar, you can find crypto ATMs and other services where you can buy or sell cryptocurrencies for cash. On their website, you can search by coin, address, if the ATM supports selling as well as buying, and you can also search by geo area, country, city, state, all that stuff. And you can also check and compare actual current fees at different ATMs. Want to find out more? Go to coinatmradar.com or c-o-i-n-a-t-m-r-a-d-e-r.com. All right, so we got that. Now, this first thing here, um, it's been a rough while for... The, the lightning not work. I mean, network. Um, <laughs> so speaking of our buddy Vlad here, uh, who, if you listen to my interview with him, he is a Bitcoiner through and through. He calls himself a Bitcoin maximalist, but I, I think that's kind of being too harsh on himself. You know, I mean, it's usually Bitcoin maximalism is like the weird cult like behavior, but he likes Bitcoin more than anything and just wants BTC to succeed. And he doesn't mind if people use other coins. But anyway, he posts this thing saying, Hello, darkness, my old friend. And he just posts this invoice from, very obviously, the Phoenix wallet. Again, the one lightning wallet I will use because it's relatively trust minimized and relatively easy to use. I still don't like to use lightning, let's be very clear. But it's, you know, prop credit where credit is due. They're, they're trying their best, at least. And it just said, failed, no funds been sent. Um error was payment attempts exhausted without success and he's sending 115 euros and 71 cents worth which is not a lot of money it's like 118 bucks or something that's not a lot of money to just fail and as i'll scroll down here is stuff he also said um i actually tried and failed about three times then decided to do it on chain later which is several dollar transaction fee so um what's your your 
I, I rant all the time. Why don't you, you say something about this? <laughs> yeah, so I, I had this same experience using Lightning just over the course of the last couple of years. There was a time when I went to El Salvador. I was actually part of the, it was Brock Pierce's group of, ambassadors who are going to pitch the El Salvadoran government on different cryptocurrency projects. And one of the things we did was go to Bitcoin Beach with the intent of buying and selling and trading with Bitcoin. Right. And of course, they were all talking about lightning hardcore. And this was three years ago. And every time we used lightning, some of the times it worked, but then some of the times it didn't work. Right. And I remember I think I was using the blue wallet at the time which, which is I, even worse because blues lightning implementation was completely custodial right 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 and i, I mean already there's a bunch of issues around the, the the centralization creep that already exists in lightning just as a result of it being a channel-based network <laughs> my i mean it didn't even work at the time but if you're going to be centralized right it should at least be as c consistent and efficient as possible in terms of its usability but it's not even it's not even that right now. So a lot of people are already, and I, I mean, you showed it with, mm -hmm. with Vlad. And there's a lot of people. I was, you sent me that that stuff, and I was not familiar with what was going on in terms of the capitulation. I, in my mind, the capitulation with Lightning Network has been happening right over the last few years. People have been complaining about it, even within the Bitcoin ecosystem itself. But this shined a new light on it for me. Joel and I went back and looked. I just typed in Lightning Network in the X feed and see all this. And then a whole bunch of stuff popped up. People trying to use Lightning, trying to make sense of it. And so they do transaction that still gets stuck or it doesn't work. And then as you and then as you had so eloquently mentioned, there are a handful of people who will try to gaslight you, who will basically say, listen, I, I used it fine. Well, maybe uh, it worked fine for you a couple of times. I'm still skeptical that it even works for them consistently just because of the nature of how it functions mm -hmm. and then we saw with your post with regards to kraken not even adopting it anymore and very plainly mentioning that there it's not useful for a custodial or self-custodial wallet right mm -hmm. it's more useful for a centralized exchange to try to adopt it and use it and then it's and then there's just so much friction trying to get get on to use it to begin with to have coins depending on what wallet you use of course but then having coins yeah. in set channel it's just, it's not really feasible from a market perspective users want usability that's that's the key if you don't have that usability then it's worthless that to, to me what was it on one of the posts that you mentioned joel someone mentioned that it was a like a get out of jail free card right for early bitcoiners They're always trumping up the lightning network all the innovation and development for scaling bitcoin was focused on the lightning network but the reality is, is it's just over time, it's gotten pro progressively worse in some ways in the sense that developers have left the project, mm. right? A lot of main folks involved yeah. have started to attract their... It's, kind of, it's kind of weird with the whole, is it, has it gotten better or worse? It depends on how you, the technology around Lightning has gotten better progressively. What's gotten worse is, first of all, the fee environment that affects mm -hmm. lightning the l1 fee environment but also the dev capitulation kind of thing and it, it's kind of interesting because um so as i pointed out with this thing um phoenix is the best wallet in on the market for lightning like hands down because it you there's no such thing as fully self-custodial lightning because all of your channels have to be in a multi-sig with another yeah. party and yes you do oh would claim if they try to steal you'll probably get all like yeah, but it's it's not a hundred percent your custody. It's you know close to they call non custodial lightning. It's not really, but it's close. So you could do that. It's hardwired into the largest lightning node by capacity and channels on the entire lightning network, which is async, this French company that runs Phoenix. And still, you have payment failures for a hundred dollars. To I mean, I don't know what Vlad is trying to pay. I usually have pretty good success with phoenix to be perfectly fair and honest it usually works okay i have not always had success though sometimes it doesn't work and for crypto transactions unless you're like a solana guy that used to 75 percent of your transactions failing usually you expect it to work even if it takes a while it's just gonna work and i mean obviously my dash world has just been super spoiled because i just snap my fingers it's done but 
even for people who are used to other cryptos, it's not a, it, the fact that this is the best pure lightning experience possible. And it's there should be no failures. It should be when you're running your own node and you're routing and you're balancing your channels, you're doing all this yeah. stuff. Okay, you're running into the issues. Fine. You're building your own infra from scratch. But this, it, it's not, ex I don't think it's acceptable to, to tell the average person, which is why I get in lots of fights with Maxis, not saying you lightnings, you not, not, not doing the like juvenile dunking, but whenever I see him doing wall of Satoshi or some kind of super custodial, like bank, basically I say, use Phoenix instead because Phoenix works pretty well. And then they're always like, nah, it's, newbies aren't going to like it. And it's like, well, that's because if you, a newbie has no money in their wallet, you have to spend a few bucks to open a channel to the newbie. And that's going to be a big friction, but that's literally how lightning works. And you can't be scamming people by just saying, no, 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 it's, it's not like, no, show the thing you're trying to get everyone to use. You don't say do the whole Jack Mahler's thing and be like, lightning this great, great. And then free. And then like, say two things that aren't the same, but sort of conflate them to where it sounds like you're misrepresenting this thing. So let's my little quick rant on that part. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, personally, I had already given up on lightning network at that point in El Salvador, whenever I was trying, it, because here's the thing. I think this is a good point when it comes to market dynamics and market economics. If you have a, a, a product, right. And you push that product into the market, and it doesn't work very well and it's already causing issues, you're going to lose a good chunk of your user base, right? They're not mm -hmm. really going to trust you to get reliable. You know, and here, because here's the thing, Lightning at that time had already been out for a while, right? At least a couple of years. So now we're going, It's it's been even longer now. You still don't have usability. In a lot of ways, it's gotten worse. As you mentioned, it's gotten worse. And you just, at some point, you move on to the next thing. It, you talk about it all the time, Joel. There's a plenty of other cryptocurrencies and technologies that you can use for very simple, easy payments. You know me; I've been a you have a hijacking Bitcoin. Rogers put behind you. Been a big fan of Bitcoin Cash for a number of years, and mm -hmm. it's still still better, even though it's not perfect. You don't have to worry about the same type of issues. It's just for scaling Bitcoin, right? That is that ultimately does not end up being the greatest solution. And uh, again, the fact that a lot of people have just said, no, I'm done and threw their hands up and, and have yeah. gone on to the next thing already. And that's just, that's where we're at market wise with the, with the tech, which, so I haven't really thought much about it, honestly, in the last couple, other than what you had pointed out. And I kind of like loosely mm -hmm. kept track of it because I had already gone on to the next thing and was using other things for my cryptocurrency day to day use case. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, that kind of that rolls right into this next point with Kraken. So um, Eric Kuhn was posting, so uh, announcing the Kraken wallet, a powerful self-custody wallet built to connect you to centralized web, blah, 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 multi-chain, um, not very many chains, but whatever, all this kind of stuff. And then down there, there's a comment that says, no lightning support. And then he answered, <laughs> which is, I guess, a ballsy move to not just be like, well, like no corporate speak, says no lightning support. I think it's pretty established at this point that Lightning is better with centralized apps that can manage all the channels. This is a self-custodial right. wallet, which is, it's a very, I would say it's a polite, very like just clear, neutral, direct thing. But because of the environment, it says it's, um, it comes off like a burn. Like this is like a sick burn, even though he's just being very like, matter of fact and nice about it, I guess. And then Bolt, some right. lightning thing says, that's a pretty unsophisticated take. Centralized does not equal self-custodial, all this kind of stuff. He says, I wouldn't call it unsophisticated. Been using lightning and running nodes since Bitcoin Pure started a node launcher six years ago. Demo lightning for Apple Pay execs. Channel management is a major point of friction, even with a lightning service provider. Like, for example, Phoenix Wallet uses that. And just like the, the amount of like, gaslighting and stuff that people are doing and again this is not a sturdy freaking b casher dude no this is <laughs> this is a lightning guy a guy who's worked in the ecosystem and he's just like listen yeah. dude this is this is the truth it's not you know it's not for like a random self-custodial wall it's just not it's not a product market fit that's all it is yep 
yeah, I mean, it that and that speaks volumes. The fact the fact that either Bitcoiners or people who are involved in the space are coming out now saying we need to rethink our options and maybe think about going another direction. You're right. That speaks volumes because it's it's saying that, well, we've we've kind of lost this fight. Of course, there are people who are going to, you know, here's the thing, too. There's people who get locked into that box and their echo chambers and they're still like, OK, but lightning's going to work. It's eventually going to work. We just need well, <laughs> the joke is another 18 months and everything's going to be fine. Right. That's still in play right? for a lot of people. I think that there's just going to be so many and there already are so many better options. I think a lot of people have just given up on the idea that Bitcoin's going to scale. Oh, this reminds me of a fantastic point, Joel. Even people like Michael Saylor have come on publicly saying that Bitcoin doesn't need to be cash, right? Mm -hmm. So they're actually Bitcoiners now. They're saying straight up, we don't care about scaling Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. They've they've given up, but they've they've put a positive spin on it where they're like, oh, it's digital gold. And, you know, that's been part of the whole theme, mm -hmm. which is really kind of incompatible with the idea of cash anyway. But it's funny what listening to Sailor actually say that it doesn't need to be cash at all. We don't need to scale it. It just needs to main, be digital gold. It just needs to say he just calls it property. Right. Just like the, the IRS yeah. refers to it as there's been a number of different people just making the claim who are in Bitcoin that it just doesn't need to be cash at all. And it doesn't need to scale. If you want to go buy coffee, go use something else or just use your, your fiat trash to buy mm -hmm. it. So this is an interesting trajectory to kind of think about this conversation from the perspective, even Bitcoiners don't even want to think about it as cash anyway. Right. And try to scale it. Maybe yeah. there's a minority still if you think along those lines. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, a, it's a weird thing because, uh, Blockstream, of course, for those who are familiar, again, if not, hijack and Bitcoin, go read it. Um, I haven't yeah. read it, by the way. I just, I, I will read it. I just, I lived through it. You know, I've been, you was a day to day user of Bitcoin since like 2013 yeah. almost. So, like, I lived through the whole thing, but I will read it. But, and uh, so Blockstream funded a lot of devs, and Bitcoin's scaling trajectory turned to a, you know, a, a layer two focused one. Now I'm going to sort of steel man block stream here for a second, which is probably not something most people expect from me, but it seems like they were funded as a company to provide layer two solutions to a problem that didn't exist yet with Bitcoin. So they created the problem. I mean, that's not too out there yet, right? Or at least they, they profited from the problem. It seems like they tried to create the best solutions possible, whether they were involved in some Lightning Network development and things like that, which the Lightning Network is pretty a pretty genius way of trying to stitch together a an actual payment experience uh, from all the just tremendous limitations of Bitcoin as far as like scriptability, like roll-ups and other kinds of stuff that you, you see more in like the EVM world are now just starting to get like talked about in the Bitcoin context. But like all that's like Lightning was just like, look, we'll technically give people keys, like their own keys to all their funds that they're touching. And we'll somehow stitch that like, it's like trying the best they, they can. And I'm even going to go as far as to say Blockstream's liquid network, which is basically a centralized cartel type thing um, that you can't get your, you can bridge Bitcoin in, but you can't bridge it out without their permission rather than a total scam, I would just say that's also the best they, they could do with the technological limitations of Bitcoin. As far, once you've accepted that you can't scale on chain, that is, that's, that's the, that's the rub. Now, past block stream is the micro strategy era where you have, I think sailors a lot like block stream. There's a lot of bad things I can say about block stream but not all of the bad things. I can say a lot of the bad things, but not all. I can say all the bad things about MicroStrategy and Sailor, where it seems like they don't give a crap about Bitcoin or decentralization or how this works or anything like that. It's pure opportunism. It's pure, let's just take this and turn it into a, a stock that we get to profit off of and probably let's use it to pump up MicroStrategy and then dump on everyone. Like, I don't think Sailor's holding forever. And his weird stuff that he talks about is this clear manipulation. I've heard a friend say that he was at some Bitcoin conference and saw MicroStrategy presenting their like tools for Bitcoin. And so they're basically trying to be the new block stream as far as like they want to like be the provider that camps on top and like does everything with it. So 
that's kind of the direction it's going. And I think that the whole Lightning Network deal, um, we're finally hitting this capitulation moment because a lot of people were just good faith Bitcoiners who just were like, you know what? I don't think big blocks are the way to go there. I've gotten scared by a lot of these things they say could happen because of it. Let's just try this out. And now it's becoming super with the ordinals move, the fees going up. It's everything's breaking. And it's becoming super obvious that now it's just not working. And they're, I guess in good faith now just being like, Hey, look, this, we tried it out. It's not working. Yeah. I kind of felt like from, from the very get go with lightning, it was just a way to appease. And, and I don't know, this might be a bit controversial, but it felt like more of a way to appease people who wanted, wanted to see Bitcoin scale rather than a good faith or earnest attempt to actually scale Bitcoin, right? I know that some of the people involved were probably sincere, but I don't feel like that was every everybody, right? Because, and like you, I lived through the scaling debates. I remember a bunch of nasty things happened when there were debates on how to scale Bitcoin. Roger, very likely, because I was there, I was working with Bitcoin.com and I was like right, right by his side. And mm-hmm. all the, the time that anybody who suggested anything about increasing the block size or having a dynamic block size all those people were censored on the bitcoin reddit for and a number of other places i think also bitcoin.org probably had some some censorship that was happening as well so it just seems like what what was the honesty what was the truth behind actually wanting to scale bitcoin and this goes back i guess to what we were talking about in terms of it being quote unquote digital gold it seems like you can't have your cake and eat it too, to some degree, right? Because having it as digital gold, right? You don't want it to necessarily be cash, but then at the same time you do. So how earnest, how honest was the desire and the goal and the drive to scale Bitcoin to begin with? I don't, yeah, I don't even know if it was that honest to begin with. And because the whole focus too has just been on, on lightning network, right? There hasn't been, in my opinion, a whole lot of innovation in the Bitcoin space. Whereas yes, over in Ethereum and the EVM world, I I have a tendency to actually think those are at least more hardcore innovative attempts to try to scale the the Ethereum, right? The Ethereum mm-hmm. blockchain. Whereas what's happened with Lightning Network has been kind of super focused on that. And on in the EVM world, you have a couple of different ways to attempt to scale Ethereum. And there has been definitely more of an open debate with less censorship. So I think we could probably make that case. Yeah, it, it is very interesting how I think that there's a lot of corollaries between Bitcoin and Ethereum with the scaling thing. But in in yeah. that, it, it's something that apparently is technically feasible to scale on-chain without major trade-offs. doesn't mean without any trade-offs, but without major trade-offs. Yeah. And it seems like very well-funded companies uh, behind Layer 2 solutions have been sort of pushing in the opposite direction. Well, you know, of course, that makes very that makes sense. However, it seems to be more more just, of course, with Ethereum and more sinister with Bitcoin. It seems to be more like there was an actual psyop, an actual thing that happened mm-hmm. during the block, block size wars. I'm not in the Ethereum community very deeply, but this is my impression. Um, but yeah, let's talk about this this capitulation thing, right? So let me just highlight this um this next tweet thingy from Reza. Um, so. As I, I mentioned, about, I did some tweet about Lightning or whatever, and then they always get really, whenever I dump on <laughs> Lightning or the Maxis, I always get a ton of engagement. I'd rather talk about other things most times, but come on, you can't argue with a free market. <laughs> so right. um, I do I do space them out a little bit. But anyway, so then Alex Gladstein would just comments clown face, which is, you know, it's it's. I think I'm destroyed by the logic of that argument. I can't get past that. But um, then this Rezo says, he isn't wrong faster we accept this the faster we can move forward to better more pragmatic solutions and it's just like okay who is this reza guy i'm just mouse over him oh he works bitfinex tether and synonym which synonym is what's his name um john carvalho's company remember he's the guy who got roger to flip him off in the interview yeah it's so (laughs) this this fellow works deep in lightning right he's works deep in lightning his boss i guess partner i don't exactly know how synonym is um constructed but john carvalho i mean he apologized to roger vera i think in 2020 for the 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 bird flip moment but 
he's become a big critic of lightning as like the ultimate scaling solution kind of thing because he has a lightning company so that's a one big profile high profile mm. person whatever and then you have obviously kraken kraken i think was the first exchange to integrate lightning in, in my opinion it does make sense for a lot of exchanges to have lightning because instead of having to withdraw your bitcoin like every quarter because you can't afford the fees you can sort of dollar cost average every day if you want and have it in like at least partial self custody every single day. Like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But so then you have, you have those guys, you have, um, I forget which lightning developer like rage quit like a few months ago. And then, uh, Fiat Jaff, who's the guy who made Noster, which is like the number one use case for lightning other than cause big custodial things for like zapping, for tipping people for social media posts. He just says we should get rid of Lightning and start over. Like literally, that's a big part of his whole project is that you have a bit refill used to let you like pay for opening a Lightning channel capacity to them or whatever. I used to have a bunch of pretty fun Lightning tools that like when I was running a node and trying it out, I, I couldn't get liquidity to my node. I couldn't figure, I would pay them to get, to help me out with some stuff. Um, I, they don't offer those services anymore. I don't know if that was like intentional or they just like me and they moved on. Uh, but the point is across the ecosystem, there's a lot of people. And of course, Vlad, as we talked about before, saying about, you know, oh, it's not working out that way, that well. There's just so many people that are just turning now that I think it's the confluence of it's the ordinals thing hit. So it's like, you know, the hype, like you, you hype it up to the moon. The hype starts to go down as like you run out of hype, run out of steep steam. The ordinals thing just like distract lightning infra, and that's of course that takes a hit. And just when they're starting to poke their heads out and say, "Hey, this isn't actually working," then boom, hijacking Bitcoin lands and just does the killer blow. And like now, all of a sudden, there's this world tour, uh, book tour basically, and a lot of the people in Bitcoin today weren't around back then, or they just kind of like. Or they were, and so therefore they're hearing this for the first time. Or they come and they have heard this before, but now they're like seeing the full picture. They're like, oh, okay, now now it's like, wait, eighteen months. Now it's been a lot of eighteen months since then, and then they're just like, okay, well, this is now I can compare. It's not just he said, she said. I can see what happened, and then they're more, and it's just causing this mass capitulation. And as I've said before, Lightning is not a scam, and I think it's going to be around. I think people will use it for, you know, custodial, or custodial may be too triggering of a word, but like institutional transfers between like exchanges and settlements and other stuff like that. There's a plenty of stuff you can use Lightning, but Lightning as peer-to-peer -peer cash is over, is what I said in that tweet. So, yeah, little rant. Yeah, yeah, no, what, what, well said. I think that's definitely the case, and I could... I could also agree with that statement that it's probably going to be perfectly fine for institutional transfers on a certain level. But I, yeah, and I really never did see it as a peer to peer, true peer to peer alternative because of all the shortcomings that it already had with the friction that was involved with the, the fact that it, I mean, yeah, you have to think a lot about a lot of things if you're a user and you come on and start using lightning, right? You got to think about channels, liquidity management paying the fee and then the the user experience depending on what wallet you there's all these things to consider so it makes sense to me that a lot of people weren't going to invest a lot of personal energy and cognitive resources to actually attempt to use lightning and that's why very early on i was like yeah this is this is a non-starter especially for people who want to very quickly get into crypto and be able to use it on, on a day-to-day -day basis it just did not make sense and this is something really that also speaks back to the capitulation point why a lot of people start saying oh no this isn't going to work there's always been problems with ui and ux and crypto and making things easy to use for the for the end user and the lightning scenario certainly hasn't helped that that particular point with all the people talking about the friction for the end user that's not what we want for mass adoption in some way Lightning has probably been antithetical to mass adoption because it scared people away and now they have to go try to find something else. You have to learn about that thing. So trying to figure out how we can get actual mass adoption and turn people onto crypto, that's still something that's always in the forefront 
of my thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy when, when shit it either doesn't make sense or it's too technical. Or there's too many things to think about. It takes way too much glucose right, to, to get involved with that particular project or that thing and, and make, make it worthy. So I'm not surprised to see more and more capitulation and finally people admitting that this is not going to work. Let's, let's rethink this. Let's go a different direction. But I'm still skeptical if whether or not they're going to actually go a different direction, right? It's probably, it could be just mm -hmm. a case where it's like, okay, Bitcoin is this, it's digital gold. Maybe we just keep our, <laughs> maybe we just stick with that. But to your point earlier, it is interesting, Joel, to note that there has been a lot of razzle dazzle in the Bitcoin ecosystem because of the, you know, Paul Stork's drive chains, the, the thing with ordinals. So a lot of people thinking we really do, and this is a good point, I think, we really do need to find some kind of utility for Bitcoin and bring some other kind of value to it. I think one of the whole reasons why drive chains were originally pitched or it, and to some degree ordinals is because there's all this other value going to the altcoin ecosystem is like how do we recapture that and i think that was actually stated on some of the improvement proposals that were pitched by various folks so this is this is interesting to see people finally in the bitcoin ecosystem realizing that you can't just go on forever as quote unquote digital gold where your utility is really non-existent right or it's very mm -hmm. limited to to people just believing it has value because it number go up, right? Absolutely. Um, it is going to be interesting to see which way Bitcoin goes from here, BTC, because um, it's definitely not going, I, I cannot imagine it goes completely custodial. I think that's a big part of it. So I do think there's appetite for um, a small bit of on-chain scaling. In fact, I've seen the conversation change between you cannot increase the block size to mm. Bitcoin already has four megabyte blocks because of SegWit, which is like SegWit semi for you know depends on how you're how you, you talk about it. you know and it's just the block weight thing is all weird. But uh, the point is, there's a lot of talk of like, well, we should maybe double the block size with this halving and see what happens, and just that, that would allow a little bit better. There's some talk about that stuff, so I don't think it's out of the a question that you could soft fork in some manner of actual block size increase, not just a SegWit style one, which is a very targeted one. So like SegWit 2X might happen like seven years later, right? Who knows? But uh, at the very, uh, people are still trying new things. Now it's like, oh, you know, lightning didn't turn out to be what we wanted. Now they're trying like, oh, let's try about like roll-ups and fediments and all the other whatever. I'm kind of bearish on all that. I don't think it's going to turn out super well. Maybe what's going to happen is enough stuff happens on rollups or whatever, and enough people use custodial solutions, and enough exchanges use Lightning that there's that's a small group of like the cypherpunks who can care will be paying like two to five dollar transaction fees to buy stuff on chain, and they can still use that. And I don't like that outcome, but it's better than nothing. Um, Otherwise, we might have to see some major changes. And I have to say, I'm a as big of a fan. Other, if second only to like actual on-chain scaling, I do think the drive chains idea, if it works as advertised, is absolutely fantastic. And Fiat Jaff, apparently the guy who started Noster, is a big fan of that idea as well. But I, if I, I would give it like a ten percent chance of happening, or maybe less. Like I just don't see it happening right now politically i just don't see it happening so are you as pessimistic on drive chains as i am or, or what yeah i i mean I, I honestly i'm not too deep into the drive chain space i've been into a couple of paul's spaces where people asked him questions but i haven't really delved deeply into it to have a, a fully thought out answer but i will say that anything that is the any additional solution to bitcoin scaling or to to taking bitcoin in a direction other than digital gold is gonna, always going to meet with a lot of resistance it's going to be very difficult to mm -hmm. to implement the only reason i think i mean ordinals sees a huge use case because it's i mean it kind of just can do it <laughs> right even though there's a lot of people who really 
dislike that particular use case. And I, I, the only reason I know anything at all about what's happening in the ordinal space is because I've been in so many spaces with the ordinal guys on, yeah. on Twitter, and it always gets pretty, pretty loud. That's funny. Yeah, well, who knows? Who knows what happens with Bitcoin? Uh, good thing there's so many alternatives. Who knows what happens with Ethereum? Um, Ethereum's the ecosystem. Who knows? who knows what happens with Solana? But it's it's good that like there's a bit of a capitulation in some way that I think is going to even out the space. Yeah. But yeah. You know. Yeah, I think that you're right. That's that's the whole point here. The fact that there's so many people starting to rethink Lightning and rethink the direction of Bitcoin. I mean, we can I can only see that as a good sign because it means that maybe something else will come into play where they're like, okay, so that maybe this makes sense. We can take it a different direction. Or they're finally like, okay, this is just going to stay digital gold, which is, I mean, I don't have any hope that Bitcoin will actually scale at this point. I think you kind of hinted at it as well. I don't think, I don't think they want that to be the point. So I'm perfectly fine using other solutions. Uh, to Roger's point, though, I mean, already the damage is done, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the whole mindset was to have Bitcoin scaling like out of the gate right back in 2015, 2016. But then this whole scenario, all the censorship, all the, the cluster fuckery that occurred has put behind the ecosystem by years now, right? In terms of scaling and mass adoption. Yeah, I unfortunately agree with that. Um, honestly, yeah. um, if I were to guess, I would say the Bitcoin, the native Bitcoin, whatever you want to call it, like scaling solutions, but somehow liquid is like liquid on their like Twitter handle is look as liquid BTC it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. There's no relation, but um, somehow I think that those native type scaling things for Bitcoin made by Bitcoiners are just not going to work out. And it's going to mostly be people using other chains, like kind of like Ethereum with wrapped Bitcoin and type, those kinds of things are the way people are going to use Bitcoin, like the, the value thing. And as I mentioned on space, wouldn't it be uh, hilarious if there, if Bitcoin cash had a BTC denominated token that just ended up taking off for mass adoption. So Bitcoin cash was the Bitcoin L2 that worked out like that would be really hilarious, but. I think it'd be something like that or like Solana, you know, BTC on Solana or whatever is like what people pay with in the future or something. I don't know. Yeah, some kind of wrapped version. And that would be really ironical if that happened with Bitcoin Cash and then it ended mm -hmm. up facilitating Bitcoin trade. Yeah, that's. Like, yeah, like that let's uh, let's hit on the ETH dam thing because we were at ETH dam as it turns out. Um, this, yeah. So, I mean, what, what, what was your impression? How, how did you, did you have a good time? Well, what do you, what do you think? Just, yeah. Yeah. I overall had a really great time. I, the event was well put together. I really liked, I watched a few, I actually watched your, <laughs> you attempt to moderate the debate between Justin and, and Tor. Yeah, that was fantastic. But the point I was going to make is that the, the video quality was extremely professional and well done. Mm -hmm. So I want to give props to Eleanor and that team for doing such a great job. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the event was had a tremendous, tremendously good time. I think the the thing that we can talk about and we can get into this if you want, mm -hmm. you know, my my focus right now, I've been primarily embedded in the in the privacy and the the deep in the de decentralized physical infrastructure space, right, with uh, mm -hmm. Logos and those guys. And my whole focus has been, you know, we need actual privacy preserving tech, right, in the space. And it's funny to see that there was that dichotomy in at ETH Dam where you had a lot of people actually promoting it. Like Amir Taki on the stage basically saying, no, we're not going to, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to capitulate to the system. We're not going to do KYC mm -hmm. and AML. But then you had the opposite. You had a lot of people building quote unquote privacy preserving technologies, but then they say that they're going to do KYC AML. And a matter of fact, the whole pitch Talk about Panther. was about doing KYC. <laughs> Panther was just one of them. What was the other yeah. one? Was, there was I know. Like, oh, was an what's his name? Um, um, Anish Muhammad from Panther Protocol has been on my show before. And so, yeah, give him a little shout out. Um, I don't agree with that <laughs> approach either, to be honest, though. Be, but yeah. do what you got to do. I like the railgun approach. I like those guys. Oh, yeah, Railgun's great. And they're also using Waku, by the way, which is part of that the infrastructural movement with Logos, mm -hmm. which is great. I no, I think that, I okay, so just to be fair, right, I worked at, mm -hmm. with CryptoSpace. I did risk 
and I was all involved in the AML and KYC space by necessity as a de facto result of the job that I did. We had to, we had to do that. I think it's a bit different though with an exchange. With an exchange, if you try to do trades with, I mean, they're one hundred. The feds are one hundred percent going to see you. They're going to accost you and harass you to the point where you're eventually going to go to prison, right? That mm -hmm. and we've seen that time and time again. You can't really get out of that unless you completely go a decentralized route with an exchange, but that problem really hasn't been solved. You have things like Bit, the BISC network that are really mm -hmm. cumbersome when you try to do privatized or anonymous exchange that really doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, not, I've, not done, as, I've done a test transaction on BISC and it was brutal. Yeah, it's really hard and it's not user friendly. Now, what I will say is this though, you, you can't make a claim that you're doing a, that you're doing actual privatized uh, you have a privatized platform or a cryptocurrency, whatever your project is, and then at the same time do KYC and AML, especially when you have a surveillance state government bureaucracy mm -hmm. that's constantly getting access to those transactions. Well, that's not really private. But, and, and to be fair, right, there are some scenarios where maybe there are really, really bad people doing bad things. And yeah, maybe that, there's a case for that. But I would say by the, by the same token, privacy is really all that we have now in terms of trying to protect ourselves from a massive surveillance state where they're constantly trying to get information and and not only just get that information but then have it at their disposal at any time and then trade it or sell it as well with so there's a data marketplace for this information as well and it's just a real tragedy so i think we have to do everything in our power to protect privacy and even anonymity as much as possible. So going the KYC AML route jeopardizes that every step of the way. And I think that they just, the U S government just talked about, I forget what the, it was like FISA or something where they're trying to implement even more overreach for the NSA, right. To be able to mm -hmm. take more and more data. So it's getting much worse. So I really don't have any love in my heart for people who are trying to say, okay, we're doing privacy, but AML and KYC, the two are incompatible. They're dichotomous. They're antithetical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's and it's one of those things where also the the laws kind of apply a lot more to centralized parties and fiat. And so yeah. I've noticed in the, just like an offhanded thing on like the spectrum of things of like. You get the worst KYC experience in crypto if you're signing up for a custodial exchange. And then if you use some non-custodial on-ramp, for example, you can usually buy for a certain amount without before KYC and then you have to do it. So it's a little bit better. And then when you're just, just using crypto on a completely non-custodial, decentralized, all that stuff, there's no KYC laws at all around that that affect that. And if they did make them, there's also nothing they can do enforcement wise to, to actually other, there was nothing they could do to actually prevent that from happening. So yeah, it's one of those things where like, that's the direction we have to go in. And if you have privacy tech, but you KYC, you're telling people everything. If you don't have privacy tech and you don't KYC, you could be hiding in plain sight. You could not, but like if someone's coming after you, they could be like, Oh, we saw, your IP address is traced to this transaction we saw based on this, that, okay, that's you and you, you know, whatever. They can dox you, which is, you know, it's not exactly KYC, but it's like, it's the same at the end. But then if you have anonymous crypto or you have like just not dox crypto and then you actually implement privacy techniques with it, even if it's just like using a new address every time and connecting over Tor, even if it's without anything like coin join or zero knowledge proofs or anything, you're still better. You're still probably not going to be like found out at least for a while, but yeah, privacy to the max privacy is human, right? And I think that honestly, we're not going to see mass adoption of crypto technology without some sort of basic robust privacy stuff, because people just aren't going to like trust their entire financial future and all their like, every time they make a trade and do like investment decisions no one no institution no fund is going to do that if it's just all public for everyone to see like they're going to demand you know something and um, i think that um kai of railgun had an interesting point when he when he's talking about that where he just said like you know uh like oh who needs i have nothing to hide and he just said like everyone has a door on their bathroom don't they ah. and he said 
So you're all heroin addicts then? <laughs> like, like, well, what do you have to hide? It's just like, no, you just, or to be a little uncouth on that, like, what do you have to hide? These nuts. <laughs> Literally, in this Absolutely. case. <laughs> Yeah, a, a, absolutely. I mean, it's the you're, you're you you hit the nail on the head when you said this is a human right, and that's one hundred percent true. And I, most cryptocurrency, a lot of well, a lot of cryptocurrency development. I want to I want to say most, but a lot has been behind a solar punk type of mindset where everything is transparent, largely right. The Bitcoin blockchain, mm-hmm. all that's another thing we can mention is that's a fully transparent ecosystem where everything is is doxed effectively, and everyone who has traded in and out of that ecosystem has likely had to KYC. And I mean, even in uh, to a, a partial degree in the traditional financial ecosystem, you have more privacy guarantees. O- obviously that's not complete, but you still have probably more than you would in the cryptocurrency ecosystem where it's even, where a lot of your transactions are going to be even more public than they would in the, in the, public sector with fiat currency so that makes it interesting here's another thing a point i want to make with with the the privacy component specifically aml and and kyc so if you're a company who tries to implement those first of all that's really really expensive to do you're obviously Mm -hmm. already you're centralized at some point you have kind of some kind of on or off ramp but i and i say this from experience when you do that Governments can still make because you're obviously trying to follow along with the rules. You don't want to go to jail, et cetera. But governments will still make your life very, very difficult just because you're a cryptocurrency company, just because you're making these promises of privacy. So being able to continue forward and do business and succeed is is going to be really, really difficult. So that's why I always recommend that you try to do things. And you mentioned this as well, well, Joel, do things as decentralized as possible and, and on as much of a peer-to-peer basis as you can, or you're going to be in really, really bad shape because they will still come after you. They will still make your life difficult. The alphabet soup boys, they don't really care at the end of the day. And then we talked about this at the very beginning, their goal. I mean, the U S in my opinion, their goal is to preserve the hegemony of the U S dollar at all costs. And this is why the rules also are not completely clear. It's also a why they Michael love- Saylor's stated goal publicly said this, but that's a different story. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it, we're just at a time now where, where privacy and even anonymity are going to be more and more highly valued for the fact that th- these are rights that are being eroded every single day in, in, a, in a worse and worse fashion. And it's really actually quite terrifying the or well so i've heard this phrase before uh, with thinking about the idea of an orwellian state you know overseeing everybody some people would say that in even in 1984 orwell was a pie-eyed optimist if you look at our current situation in terms of the surveillance state yeah i mean it's more of a technological thing um which by the way random shout out to naomi brockwell who does a lot of privacy education and she just dropped a a video Ah collab as it were with jose monkey who's a tiktok creator who people just send him a picture or a video of themselves and say find out where i am in the world and he goes and like does like google earth kind of stuff and well according to this is the street sign appears to be in like sort of it looks probably like you know you're in minsk belarus in this side street over here it's like wow how did i get that all from one picture and it the fact that like people with advanced tools not just this guy with google earth and that's it like could find out just about anything like it's pretty scary to that degree but yeah privacy is a fundamental human right and privacy is normal and that was the, the whole point of eth dam hopefully it'll be rebranded crypto dam by next time but we'll see and um yeah uh any parting thoughts then if well as we get starting to try to like wrap this thing up yeah no i would just say that the eth dam overall was great and it, it is good I will mention this is important. It is good that the KYC AML folks are there so that we can actually have an active debate and those people aren't censored and they can make their case for why they think they should do KYC and AML and why they think it's important. And I, I know the argument part of not wanting to go to jail is a big, uh, at least it's on, it's below the surface and that's, that's valid. So it's good yeah. that they're there. That's all I'm saying. They should be. I'd like to stay out of jail if I could. Thank you. Uh, um, it's important, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we come out the magical part of the show called Shill O'Clock, where 
Is it that time already? Yeah, it's chill o'clock. Um, so what do you want to shill? I'm just going to bring up your Twitter page to begin with. Um, we'll start there and then just what else, wherever else you want to floor is yours. What else you want to talk about? Yeah, my, my website. So I'm, I've been producing content as regularly as possible. SterlingLuhan.com mm -hmm. is a good one. I have uh, video content there that I create. I've been doing some stuff on YouTube. Been a little busy. haven't posted something like a month, but will. And then the organization that I'm working with, Logos.co, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to show Logos. Right? And there's, I think, Logos, at Logos underscore network, I believe, is the Twitter. Yeah. I have to look. Just say, yeah, I'll throw all that on the screen. People, please feel free to check that stuff out. Um, yeah. Well, thanks very much for coming on. This has been a great, great show. I encourage everyone to follow you on Twitter and, you know, all that stuff. And, um, yeah, we're going to be um, probably going to see you in a couple months here. There we go. Clappy, clappity clap. Um, two months, right? So probably I'll see you around in two months if anyone's going to the Porcupine Freedom Festival, also known as Pork Fest, in the pristine mountains of New Hampshire. It's a fantastic, fun conference, festival, everything. Um, just make sure you get your planning done now because if you don't like camping, hotel rooms are harder to come by, especially in advance. And then also it's like the closest major airport is like two and a half miles, two and a half hours drive away. So you got to just fig figure all that stuff out in advance if you're coming. But yeah, make sure to... You know, come to that. That'll be fun. I'll probably be in Austin in like a month, a month and a half maybe for consensus. And yeah, I mean, if you can afford one of those tickets, I'll see you. <laughs> um, I got mine comped, thankfully. But anyway, um, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, don't forget that your phone is spying on you. Taxation is theft. Uh, fiat is a scam. Start living on crypto before it's too late. I'll see you all guys next week. Uh, peace.